All right. <clears throat> Actually, let's go somewhere else. Walmart. Now that we're here, let's talk about economic planning. Not the personal finance, Instagram guru, retire at 24 with this one trick and my $80 course kind, but the kind that's concerned with how we organize our entire economy. If you've ever played a city building game, you kind of get the idea. You manage resources, from raw materials to labor power, with the goal of building a functional and stable society. Economic planning is one approach to the organization of the economy that doesn't rely on, or at least minimizes the role of, markets in economic organization. Markets are full of problems, not the least of which being the ridiculous assumptions made about human behavior that they rely on. And the idea with planning is that instead of a competitive free-for-all, with vast inequalities and in influence determining what happens, who works, for how long, doing what, and with what goals in mind, decisions are arrived at democratically. In capitalism, the singular goal of profit animates economic decisions, and there's a less-than-perfect overlap between what is necessary and good, and what is profitable. By contrast, economic planning attempts to coordinate economic activity through some amount of forecasting, some amount of general economic steering, and a lot of coordination and cooperation. It often involves people communicating and organizing around their needs without using price as the sole indicator of what they want. But with that, and with economic planning in general, there's a tremendous amount of variation in what it can actually look like. But let's be honest, before we even get into the details, we need it. We need economic planning. Okay, okay, so hold up. I, uh, I wanna get a couple things clear before we go any further. For one thing, it's pretty obvious to everyone that the market will just not save us from things like ecological collapse, right? Like, climate change is already making life a lot worse for hundreds of millions of people, and it's objectively just not going to get better. We can't buy green our way out of this. Capitalist markets, for all the great things Elon Musk stands somehow find to say about them, are just not capable of solving climate change in a way that doesn't end up with billions of people being displaced, sacrificed on the altar of capital, or being subjected to new forms of totally based rare earth metal imperialism. Capitalist economies need infinite growth. They demand it at any cost. And on a planet with finite resources, with the fossil fuel industry having the most power of any institution, period, capitalism and its markets are just not going to be the thing that gets us out of this. We need a plan for how to continue living on this planet, meeting our needs, organizing ourselves collectively to manage our material requirements and our well-being, not just letting whoever feels like it pull more from the earth than it can regenerate because they can make a quick buck. Capitalist economies are very narrow-minded. They only care about what can be monetized. But an economy is not just a question of what we produce. An economy is everything from how we organize care to how we keep our ecosystems alive. Something that monetization and extractivism don't gel with. Plus, you know, capitalist markets produce crushing inequality. They require it. Market capitalism is stuck in a constant boom and bust cycle that throws millions of people into sudden poverty, while enriching those with enough capital to outmaneuver the collapse. Really, how many once-in-a-lifetime crashes have kids born in the 2000s already seen? Stagflation and monopolization are inevitable. In fact, they're the norm. But the levers to remedy them are kept out of democratic control. And not to be that guy, but now that it's back in the news, if you need to bail out private banks every time they crash, which seems like it's a lot, because it would destroy the economy if you didn't, maybe private banks shouldn't be given economy-destroying potential in the first place. We very clearly need to imagine implementing something different or the vast majority of the planet will continue to suffer from decisions only a few people get to make. And interestingly, we can actually look at Walmart for inspiration. Speaking of Walmart... Walmart is the company with the most revenue in the world. Just last year, they made an insane $570 billion in revenue. And to give you an idea of how much money that is, there are fewer than 30 countries in the world with a GDP that big. Those two metrics are pretty different, to be clear. But still, most people alive today live in a country whose government isn't playing around with a budget nearly as big as Walmart's, and a smaller internal economy. Walmart has about 11,000 stores, and over 2 million employees in 24 countries. 
But that's just Walmart proper. According to the company, Walmart has over 100,000 global suppliers, many of which are so embedded in the Walmart economy we might as well consider them a part of Walmart itself. This is a huge business, and the kind of money it generates is what makes the family that owns Walmart, the Waltons, a Walton of money. And although Walmart is the biggest, there's a solid handful of companies just like it. So looking for inspiration at Walmart seems like a bad idea, right? I mean, it's no secret that places like Walmart and Amazon only have the kind of cash flow they do because of some of the most brutal examples of capitalist exploitation we've ever seen. Walmart pays its workers starvation wages that push them onto Medicaid and food stamps. The company is aggressively anti-union. It has one of the worst turnover rates in the country. It frequently denies its workers overtime pay and engages in other wage theft practices. It regularly violates labor laws. And it relies on child and sweatshop labor for some of its products. It uses intrusive surveillance tech on its clients and its workers. It greenwashes. And of course, it decimates local businesses by undercutting their prices so it can establish a local monopoly. In many ways, Walmart is the epitome of capitalist business practices. The perfect case of profit first, meaning everybody and everything else f right off and dying. When I said we could look to Walmart for inspiration for something new, obviously I wasn't talking about any of that stuff. All of this is very much part of the old world that we need to leave behind. What can be of inspiration to a post-capitalist socialist society, however, is how Walmart coordinates its economy. Because despite being the iconic embodiment of capitalism, Walmart looks a lot like a country with a planned economy. Okay, here, before you tune out... Okay... Look, we're already... I don't know how many minutes into this video, and I need to clear something up. Capitalism does not equal markets. Socialism does not equal planning. In fact, despite the constant preaching about the efficiency of the market, capitalists and capitalist governments actively hate markets, and will do everything they can to avoid dealing with them. That's part of the appeal of becoming a monopoly or capitalist governments bailing out banks. It's capitalists escaping the market's negative consequences as much as possible, and giving themselves more predictable outcomes than markets provide. But I'll explain that in a second when we go back to talking about Walmart again. Anyway, capitalism does not equal markets, socialism does not equal planning. At the most basic and oversimplified level, what differentiates the two is who has ownership of and control over economic production. Under capitalism, it's capitalists. They own businesses privately, and the general structure of society, its laws, its politics, its economy, and so on, are geared towards satisfying their need making profits, often at the cost of collective needs, like air that's still good to breathe or people having enough money to not have to finance a pizza with zilch or afterpay. Under capitalism, profit guides economics, and it goes to the small group that owns factories, land, stores, hotels, stuff like that. Socialism, though, is collective, democratic ownership and control over economics, where everyone's needs and wants are given equal weight where capitalism has a one-dollar, one-vote system and is perfectly content with some people, and some corporations acting like people, having a hundred billion votes and some people having zero or even negative votes, socialism is guided by a one-person, one-vote ideal, which is not just limited to voting for a new representative every four years. It's not a question of markets or planning. Capitalists use planning, and many socialist societies have used markets in their economic structure. The socialist society we want to see fully realized doesn't need to be planned to be good or socialistic. But that said, economic planning is one of the tools at our disposal for coordinating a socialist society. But first we have to talk about what makes it appealing. So let's go back to Walmart and that point about planning and capitalism. As much as capitalism's advocates will tell you that economic planning died in the 90s with the Soviet Union, planned economies have been the backbone of a properly functioning capitalism. The problem is that they are far from democratic, and most of the time, they're hidden from sight. Walmart plans, plain and simple, just like every other capitalist business. Walmart just does it at a massive scale. Think about it. There is no internal market at Walmart. Different departments, stores, trucks, and suppliers aren't out there signing contracts with one another, paying transaction fees, competing over the same resources, and trying to undercut each other with lower prices. Operations are coordinated and planned ahead of time to make sure that each store is appropriately stocked, staffed, and prepared, oftentimes before Walmart has collected any sort of price or market signal. This is thanks to Walmart's Resource Logistics Management System, 
Throughout the supply chain, every actor in the Walmart economy has to act in complete contradiction to capitalist market dogma. They need to operate with trust, openness, and cooperation. Transparency and planning. Creating instructions to follow for weeks, months, and years. Sharing data about inventory, location, and efficiency. All of these things define Walmart's operations a lot more than chaotic competition. Because once Walmart determines who its suppliers are, there is no more market mechanism to speak of. Products are produced, transported, stocked, shelved, and accounted for, all according to a plan that Walmart lays out ahead of time and adjusts based on the information it receives from its retailers, shippers, and staff in real time. More than real time, much of Walmart's efficiency comes from its ability to determine ahead of time how many products it needs, where they need to go, and stocking the shelves in anticipation so it's never missing a sale because of a lack of inventory. And because data sharing is a necessary part of this process, Walmart and all its suppliers actually act more like a single firm than sellers and clients. Otherwise, if that friction was constantly introduced into the system, it would lose the efficiency that Walmart depends on. And this isn't just me saying this. Walmart itself calls this process collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment. It brags about how great it makes its business, and describes it as, quote, a set of actions taken by supply chain partners to plan and communicate tasks to meet customer demand while reducing cost. It includes business planning, sales forecasting, and replenishment of raw materials and finished goods. This sounds an awful lot like a planned economy, coordinated from the most basic unit, raw materials, to the final product. When you read the different steps in the CPFR process, it all seems like a far cry from the supposed anarchy of markets, where prices are constantly in flux and an army of small producers compete over consumers. In direct contradiction to what capitalist economists like Mises or Hayek believed, that information about consumption is too hard to collect, aggregate, analyze, and use as the basis of predictive and adaptable production, that instead individual producers must follow the whims of the markets and price as best they can or risk preemptively overproducing, what Walmart and every other business that has copied its model exemplify is that data can be collected and used to predict accurately where things need to go ahead of time. And it works. Rarely does Walmart's model make a costly mistake. However, because Walmart and similarly any other company doing the same thing, like Amazon, are in the business of gleaning profit off this process, this system isn't even as good as it could be. With no internal democratic framework to decide what is acceptable to optimize and what isn't, how profit might instead be used not on shareholder payout but on greater efficiency and automation, the company limits its own innovations, like automated shelving with warehouse robots, to take advantage of cheaper, overworked, and highly surveilled human workers who have little ability to institute structural change. In any case, inside a sea of market competition, there are islands of planning so big they actively look like countries. But that's already giving market competition too much credit. The sea of market competition within which these corporate planned economies operate is also very much planned. For starters, banks, both the private and central kind, are in the business of allocating funds and planning the economy. With just a keystroke, they create money that will go to fund certain endeavors over others, based on their predictions and what they want to see happen. But that's not all. Central banks use their control over things like interest rates to steer the whole economy, often, in capitalist countries, to tip the scale in favor of employers. But go another step further, and you'll find that financial firms coordinate the economy too. They do so by owning shares in as many companies as possible. And it works like this. An investor who has holdings in one airline or telecom wants it to outperform the others, to increase its profits even if only temporarily at others' expense. But an investor who owns a piece of every airline or telecom, as occurs in a passively managed index fund, has drastically different goals. Competition no longer matters. The overriding interest now is squeezing the most out of customers and workers across an entire industry, no matter which firm does it. In principle, capitalist competition should unremittingly steer the total profits across the sector down, ultimately to zero. This is because even though every firm individually aims for the highest possible profit, doing so means finding ways to undercut competitors and thus reduce profit opportunities sector-wide. Big institutional investors and passive investment funds, on the other hand, move entire sectors towards concentration that looks much more like monopoly. 
with handy profits, as firms have less reason to undercut one another. The result is a very capitalist sort of planning. And this isn't a rare occurrence. The chance that any two firms in the broad S&P 1500 index of the US stock market have a common owner that holds at least 5% of shares in both is today a stunning 90%. In other words, undemocratic planning is the point towards which competitive capitalism converges. And just to really hammer home this planning under capitalism point, look at a company like Sears. In 2004, the company was taken over by a hedge fund, and Edward Lampert was put at its head. Lampert had drunk the competition is better than planning Kool-Aid, and he went about completely reorganizing the company from the inside, turning all its different units into their own little autonomous and competing companies. In other words, bringing the market, and all the supposed good things capitalists have to say about them, inside the company. So you have looked inside his performance and how he actually runs this company, and it's fascinating. It's not your typical retailer. The way he runs it is radically different from really any retailer. It's much more, as we said in the piece, kind of like a hedge fund. Um, instead of an integrated model where you know all the different divisions are supposed to work together and under the same leaders, they're almost like autonomous businesses, each with their own P&L, their own CMOs, their own leaders. Their own board of directors, too. Their own boards that have to meet constantly, yes. And it hasn't been working. Who does he delegate leadership to? Who does he delegate authority to? Well, to dozens of independent businesses. Um, you know, they each have autonomy. They're each accountable for their own results. So there's like appliances. I go to Sears and I buy a washer and a dryer. There's exactly. one separate business for that. <laughs> That's its own business, yes. With its own profit and loss statement, its own leader. Well, let me ask the obvious question. Within a typical Sears, how many separate businesses are there? It's varied a little bit, but uh, over 30 is what we found. Lampert's plan was a show. Just to give you an idea of what Lampert's plan looked like in practice, when a sub-company within Sears, like the apparel division for example, wanted to use IT or HR, or work with any other part of the company for that matter, they had to do what different businesses do, sign contracts and pay transaction fees, every time. But of course, internally, different businesses would find it was cheaper to get outside contractors than to work within Sears. For example, Craftsman Tools found it was cheaper to get batteries if they didn't use the in-house brand Die Hard. So Die Hard's profits took a hit. And that story was repeated all throughout Sears. Oftentimes it was just better to screw over other Sears units completely than work together like in a normal business. The bottom line of the company wasn't their concern, just whether their unit would have good profit loss statements. So different product units would compete over the limited shelving space, apparently ending up with stores where screwdrivers were right next to lingerie, because they weren't trying to optimize what customers got as a whole, just what they could squeeze from each other. Loss leaders, the products that sell but don't make profit in order to bring customers in for the more profitable products, were completely screwed over now, so they were forced to jack up their prices. Everybody was constantly trying to undercut everybody else. And it got so bad that at internal company meetings, executives were putting screen tint on their laptops to stop each other from spying. The company wasn't doing well before Lampert took over, but the internal market only hurt it more. Once the money really started drying up, all hell broke loose with the different units all fighting over the same resources and having no reason to collectively invest in the store's infrastructure, capital expenditure stopped almost entirely. Year after year, Sears was reporting billions of dollars of losses. The thing is that each individual unit acted in perfect capitalist rationality. It screwed over its competitors trying to look out only for itself and its profits, and it ultimately killed its host in the process. Sears filed for bankruptcy in 2018. This is why companies monopolize, integrate vertically and horizontally, expand into new sectors, find common investors, bring their suppliers in with transparency requirements, and plan. Because when companies act in a competitive manner, they lose out on efficiency and their narrow-minded interest for profit bite them in the long run. It's not hard to see the mess that happened within Sears as analogous to the mess happening in the rest of our global competitive economy. The fossil fuel industry has absolutely no interest in not pumping more carbon into the atmosphere because the more oil is burned, the more their lines go up. It will keep going down this path, screwing over its less polluting competitors and all of us collectively until the Earth is completely unlivable because profit dictates its every move. Not the health of the wider economy or the humans that make it up. Only its interests matter. Which is to say the interests of the handful of people that have ownership of fossil fuel companies. 
But back to planning. Interestingly enough, the modern planned economies we have today in companies like Walmart and Amazon were all predated by socialist planned economies. Of course, the USSR had Gosplan, but that manual computing and quota-based system looks pretty outdated today. More similar to the kind of planning that exists in a modern firm is what was happening in Chile with Project Cybersyn. To summarize it really briefly, in 1970, Salvador Allende, a socialist, was elected as president of Chile, despite the best efforts of the US to make sure that didn't happen. From funding the two main opposition candidates, to creating anti-Allende press outlets, through funding, training, and infiltrating fascist groups, creating an economic blockade, and withdrawing quote-unquote foreign aid, which is to say cutting the please don't elect a socialist fund, the US government and US companies poured hundreds of millions of dollars into preventing Chile from controlling its own economy. That's because before Allende, American businesses in copper, banking, telecommunications, and various factories were mostly under American capitalist control and extracting wealth from Chile to the US in a process known as unequal exchange. Much of this meddling, by the way, has been declassified and admitted outright in the Church Commission report or verified in released recordings of President Nixon. In any case, when Allende became president, he had a daunting task, creating a democratic socialist economy in a relatively poor country assailed on all fronts, political, economic, and social, by the world's largest superpower. To get around this, Allende's government set out to create a whole new economy one that would be planned and organized with real-time information collected on a national network of computers. Allende's goal was to create a decentralized, democratic, and anti-bureaucratic network that could allow for a degree of national economic planning to be coupled with local autonomy in a country with only about 50 computers to its name. It would have a control center at the top, a physical network of computers to relay data, an economic simulator with which planners could experiment before implementing policy changes, and a system of anonymized public feedback. The idea behind this effort, Project Cybersyn, was that economic producers would input their production data into the system and have access to information that would allow them to coordinate across the economy. If a problem arose, say a machine breaks down, something isn't getting to the factory on time, there's some kind of shortage, and so on, individual units had time to respond to it autonomously before the problem made its way up the system to avoid knock-on effects. The system also had the advantage of disincentivizing lying, since the multiplicity of data inputs meant that an anomaly would quickly stand out, and the benefits of honesty would allow more efficient coordination. And it worked, especially in a crisis. In 1972, employers in Chile went on a reactionary strike, locking factories and blocking the country's truck freight transportation in the hopes of crashing the economy and destabilizing the socialist government. But they failed. That's because workers and the United Chilean left rose against their employers, opening the factories and running their truck routes themselves, repairing trucks on repurposed shop floors, and fighting this counter-revolution directly in the streets. And Cybersyn helped in their efforts. Fuel shortages in different sectors were communicated via Cybersyn to nearby enterprises that could help. Blocked roads were reported and new transportation lines were coordinated in real time. And the places that needed raw materials most to continue functioning were easily identified and provisioned, ultimately allowing the government and the Chilean people to weather a storm that could have ended their socialist experiment before it had properly started. All this before the internet, by the way. Of course, Cybersyn had its limitations. The project had barely two years to be thought up and implemented in a context of brutal economic isolation before a fascist coup replaced the democratically elected socialist Allende with Augusto Pinochet, the neoliberal, anti-communist dictator who quickly scrapped it altogether. Cybersyn never matured beyond its most basic beginnings. Its real-time adjustment system never became a reality, with delays often hovering around two weeks. Gender biases and lingering class structures limited worker participation in creating the project and maintaining it. And the system of anonymized feedback that would make it so responsive was never actually implemented. Nonetheless, the echoes of Cybersyn exist in our modern planning systems and give us tremendous potential to imagine what the future of planning can look like. Thanks to Cybersyn, and to the ways in which planning happens under capitalism, we can easily visualize what a democratic and socialist planned economy could actually look like with local units working in autonomous democratic fashion, reporting data through an online portal, and toggling switches to indicate shortages and surpluses that can be weathered or distributed through the larger network. In this system, what can be dealt with at the local level should be. 
decisions can travel upwards and horizontally to guarantee autonomy. And downward regulation and planning can both steer a general direction governed by democratic mandate and prevent ecologically destructive excesses that might arise at the lower levels. But perhaps one way to explain um, the concept to sort of more, more lay people is imagine that instead of buying things, you requisition them. So you're, you're, you're putting in like a requisition order to the system, like, okay, we need this and that and this and that. And, uh, you know, it could be printer paper or whatever. And it just gets sort of added to the cost of your workplace. And it kind of, it all kind of averages out in the end. So you don't have to worry about all these. Yeah, th that could be one, one way to explain it. Another way could be, again, to, to point to the, the chaotic nature of the market and the business cycle and the present situation with the electricity prices in Europe, for example, it you know, from one one day you can have the prices one and a half euros per kilowatt hour. The next day it's minus five cents. It's ridiculous. And you can kind of go with like, okay, yes, you know, we have, <laughs> you could have an economic system where you have certainty for quite a long time. You know that as long as there's no natural mm. disaster, and even if there's a natural disaster, you know that you have reserves of this and that already available. So uh, that could be one way to sort of sell it to, to the lay person, let's say. Just pretend it's in the cloud. So, so you have like a planning cloud and you, let's say you log into a, a front end over your web browser and it just, you know, it takes care of all the heavy lifting for you. And you, you could, you know, you could make sure you have a regional backup system for this and you, you can do like because um, there will be a problem like everyone cannot log into the exact same computer at the same time like a billion people on the same computer that's going to be difficult but you could imagine you know you you have a municipal little cluster of 100 computers that's not inconceivable and you maybe you log into that and you do you know you, you make a rough thing it may be maybe in a week it gets synchronized centrally and then you know but that's uh, perhaps uh, overly technical okay so no one w we wouldn't require you know supercomputers tied into each business right we could have fairly modest hardware that would all be able to communicate on on fairly standard networks and then all that information would be aggregated um, and fed into a presumably larger machine that would run the the more important nationwide uh, side uh, yeah the access to the cloud uh, yeah well, uh, between everyone right uh, yeah yeah i think it's better the cloud metaphor is better just kind of pretend that okay. it's just yeah. there yeah yeah because we can do that and none of this means abandoning markets or gift economies or anything like bringing everything under the plan most things we do for daily social reproduction don't require planning. Planning is not the way to do socialism. It's just a tool of economics. Oftentimes when we imagine the future or feel paralyzed by trying to change the present, we easily get our imagination stuck in either a primitivist dystopia, a productivist fully automated society on a burnt up planet, or a market dictatorship under the ultimate megacorp. To talk about planning in more realistic and democratic terms is not to sell you on it, but to give credibility to the possibility of a socialist economy that actually provides for everyone and responds to our desires. Because it's feasible. We don't have to come up with the perfect system and figure out every detail before we work to change society. No historical movement has ever worked like that. And in those watershed moments where everything seems to change at once, there is always room for those who come after to make improvements. All we need is something better, not something perfect. And since we know we can make a more democratic, a more efficient, and a more sustainable economy with the tools at our disposal today, that's enough to start. One of the things I get asked a lot on this channel is how to help parents or friends break out of their little propaganda bubble. One of the best ways I've found to help people understand where exactly their news is coming from and who it benefits is introducing them to Ground News. Ground News is a website and mobile app that gathers over 50,000 news sources in one place, so readers can see how a particular story is being framed by various news outlets. For every story, you'll see the number of sources reporting and which political subgroup they fall into. Now, as I've explained many times in my videos, there's no such thing as unbiased media. We all have a bias, whether we're aware of it or not, and that's true for the news too. And while political bias can be pretty complex, Ground News gives readers a general direction for assessing coverage using ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. 
These ratings also look at how reliable the news outlet's reporting practices are and who owns them right in the app. No tedious research required. The side-by-side -side comparison feature lets you read and compare news articles to see how subtle changes in wording or sentence structure can impact our interpretation of a story. And their blind spot feature, which highlights stories that are disproportionately covered by one political faction, is a great way to demonstrate how media bubbles work. So if you have someone in your life who could use some help making sense of the news and building stronger media literacy skills, Ground News is a fantastic way to do that. So head to ground.news slash second thought and give it a shot today. I promise it'll make your life a whole lot easier. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my other work by following the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.